Welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and if you are joining us for the first time, we talk about how things in Montpelier shake out for Wyndham County and basically just the rest of us. I want to introduce to the show regular contributor, Representative Emily Kornheiser, one of three representatives for the town of Brattleboro. Hello, Emily. Hello, Olga. And also for the first time on the show, Deb Brighton. She is one of the members of the Vermont Tax Commission who just earlier, well, mid-month actually, submitted their draft report of the Vermont Tax Structure Commission to the legislature. And in it is a number of recommendations for how to overhaul Vermont's taxing system, um, kind of with the goal to uh, develop long-term recommendations to help make the state um, overall tax system more fair, more sustainable, and simpler. I bet a lot of people would appreciate that. Some of the recommendations, uh, I just pulled a few that jumped out at me. Uh, Restructuring the homestead education tax, broadening the sales tax, analyzing um, with the goal to eliminate uh, certain tax burdens and, um, and the benefits, Cliff, and then utilize tax policy to address climate change. So that's just a handful of the recommendations in this report. And I have to say, Deb, I'm really excited for today's conversation. So thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> And we understand that uh, there were certain chapters in the report that you worked on. So we will probably stick to those chapters more than some of the other areas of the report. But before we get started, I want to pose a question to Emily first, and then Deb, if you could follow up on this. I'm curious, why does, why did Vermont need this report? And why now? So why does it matter, basically? <laughs> um, always a good question for a reporter to start with. Yes. Why does it matter? Um, so one of the things that we've talked about over the last years, even on this show, is the challenge within the legislative committee structure and within sort of the two-year biennium election cycle of thinking broadly and of thinking sort of across area and of doing the kind of I guess we could call it strategic planning um, that really helps us see visions for the future. And so what has become something of a tradition is around every 10 years or so, we commission a report like this to really look across our tax structure, um, across certain tax areas and ask the question, what could we be doing better? And I was really fortunate to have asked the advice of Deb um, about a month ago when I was appointed to Ways and Means and said, if I was gonna read anything, what should I read? And she recommended this history of Vermont taxes. Um, that was actually incredibly interesting and happy to post the link in comments later if anyone else is interested in reading it. It was fairly quick, but really helped me see that, you know, as with most um, wicked problems as they call them in the public administration field, um, the issues that we're grappling with in tax policy are issues that we grapple with decade after decade after decade. And you can see sort of the threads of so much that was discussed in this draft tax structure commission in what was essentially tax structure commissions from a hundred years ago. Um, and there's something both comforting about that and a tad depressing but just to know that there is no perfect tax structure. We're always balancing these really three key forces when we're looking at good tax structures. And I think Deb will definitely probably hit on um, that piece of their work. So I'll save that for her. But it's really, um, it's really just to continue to be looking broadly and far out, which is something that is hard to do within the committee biennium bill structure, so. Thank you. Yeah, Deb, love, love to hear about, you know, why this report matters. Well, I would say that's exactly right about why we take a look at these things every 10 years. Um, <clears throat> and 
it's not just the legislature that has a hard time because of the two year time frame and stuff. Anybody working with taxes is working with one tax and you know, you're just right in the middle of that one tax. And um, for me, it, I have been in at the education tax for a long time and it was sort of an opportunity. We we're looking at the structure, not just the individual taxes. And it was an opportunity to try to see how they all fit together. And, um, you know, whether we're really, we have these principles like it should track ability to pay, but do they, when you layer them all together, um, how do we know, how do we measure? Uh, and so it was, for me, it was, it was an opportunity to do that when I had been so focused on one particular tax all along. Um, and I think the, um, the commission report is, so it does two things and um, it looks at that structure, but it also looks at the individual taxes. And Graham Kleppner, one of the commissioners, um, made this sort of geometrical description of what we did. <laughs> and that is that there are three main taxes and those are like verticals. And you can tax on income, you can tax on property, you can tax consumption. Those are three main categories of taxes. Mm -hmm. And so we had those, but we also worried about the horizontals, the things that cut across them, that tied them together. And there were sort of two categories of the horizontals. One would be things, um, trends, things that are happening to society, changes, outside of the tax structure that will affect the tax structure. Um, and so those are things like demographic change, technological changes, climate change. And then there was the attempt to look at horizontally the entire structure and how it reflected certain principles. Um, you know, like the ability to pay, is it um, competitive with other states? Um, is it sustainable? Is it fair? basically. Um, and so this particular commission, the, the one 10 years ago, um, uh, had minority report. They had, there were three members and they had a minority report. And um, what, so- you, for, um, hmm. Some of our listeners might not know what a minority report is. Well, oh, okay. they're, they're going to think it's the Tom Cruise movie is probably what they'll think. <laughs> oh, oh, it's kind of boring then. <laughs> so they, they didn't all agree, basically. Two members made some recommendations and the third member disagreed. Um, and so this most recent commission decided from the very first day that this was gonna be consensus. And if we couldn't agree on something, we couldn't recommend it. So in a sense, I think it's a stronger report that in that, you know, we've gotten people to agree and the members are appointed by one by the governor, one by the president pro tem of the Senate and one by the speaker of the house. So that, you know, we came from different, we're appointed from different points of view. We had different points of view. Um, <clears throat> and then, we happen to have um, Graham Kleppner, who's in retail. Um, he's a, a CFO, I guess, of Danforth Pewter. And um, he got the Terry Eric Award from the Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility. And then another person is um, Steve Trenholm. He's a CPA. He has a master's of science in taxation and he does um, a lot of tax works for clients, um, corporate as well as individual. So he was really the income tax person. I remember when I he would, introduced himself, he described himself as um, he does tax for high wealth individuals, which is always, a, it's just a phrase that like always sticks out for me. Um, I love the yeah. euphemism of it, so yes. That, that surprised me too. Yeah. Um, did he say high wealth or high net worth? Oh, maybe he said high net worth. I think it was Sorry. high net worth. Totally said high net worth, yes. Yeah. Because, yeah, I, um, so he just recently started that. He used to work for Gallagher Flynn. Okay. And then now he's gone into the into this private thing that 
um, is involving the high net worth. High net worth. Um, but anyway, it, that's good because that's a field I don't know anything about. <laughs> no experience there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, so we we each took our our sort of our um, vertical, and my vertical was the education. Um, traditionally, the property taxes. Mm hmm. And was there anything I know, I know that you have been working with taxes for a very long time, but in this deep dive, what stood out for you? Did you learn anything new? Did anything surprise you? Or did you see our taxing structure in a new way? It's a great question. I think um, the biggest uh, learning curve for me on this was um, we say that we want to tax um, based on the ability to pay and um, everybody agrees but how do you measure the ability to pay mm. yeah. we don't really know how so most people just say well it's, in it's based on income and um, but you know that two people could have the same income, but if somebody has a lot of investments, a lot of assets, they have actually a much greater ability to pay. So income's or only part someone, of the picture. Or if someone sort of owns, you know, owns their house versus has a high mortgage or, you know, a whole generation of folks with really overwhelming student loan debt, yeah. right? So much contributes to an ability to pay. That's right. Yeah. And we don't really measure it. Hmm. So um, our income tax is based on income. And it's, it's, well, you know, you filled out your income tax, you know what they ask for. Um, and the property tax has, people have assumed that the property tax is fair because um, a house in, is an indication of your wealth. And that, you know, that's, so therefore we should tax it because we're getting at your wealth. Um, and, but we looked at it to see if the property tax, if, the, if your house value really is a good indication of your wealth. And Emily brought up the first point, which is like, some people have a mortgage on it and some people don't. You know, so if you're taxing the value of a house that's, say the house is worth $200,000, but it's got a huge mortgage on it. Your tax is though you had an asset of 200, that worth $200,000, but do you really? Um, mm -hmm. And then the other piece of it is that when you look at assets or you look at, let's say net worth, meaning your, all your assets minus your debt. Okay. And um, as you go up, the scale in net worth, you find out that um, at the very low end, a house value is probably greater than your total net worth because you've got a mortgage on it. And when you get to the high end, you find that the house value is only less than half, I think it's like 20 something percent of your net worth because you've got all these financial assets. So to try to tax on a house value to represent net worth, it just doesn't get there. It's just going in the wrong direction, actually. Interesting. So one piece that I thought was really interesting in your report, a sort of a theme that ran across it, is that when I first started learning about taxes, there was sort of, you know, simplicity and fairness and what is the third one? Sustainability. Is sustainability the third one? From our report? Yeah. Yeah, sustainability. Okay, thanks. Well, the appropriateness, they called it, but okay. yeah. Um, and I have always been thinking about it in terms of sort of each individual category of tax, but the idea that this is something that could be sort of balanced over the whole yeah. span of someone's financial existence or over the whole state, and that things sort of have more of a chance to balance out was really interesting to me because it's really it's really hard to have 
both sort of fairness, equity, and simplicity um, because of all the things that we just talked about with regards to someone's house. And so that we can sort of pull the levers in different places in the interests of having an overall progressive tax structure was helpful for me to get my head around as I was reading it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think if I can follow up on that with the sales tax. Yeah. Um, that's, the, um, that's the rationale for the sales tax recommendation. So the first thing that people look at is that, you know, um, we're recommending that we put a sales tax on essentials like clothing and food and, um, but, and, and we, right now we exempt it because we say it's a necessity, you know, so we have to take the sales tax off. Um, and first of all, the sales tax, um, you know, it, it's only six cents on the dollar, 6%. Um, <clears throat> so it maybe isn't enabling people to get that necessity. <laughs> you know, it may not be the thing that's standing in your way of that necessity. But also, if you think you know about this, for the sales tax alone, I think I've got to look at this number. Um, so the 40% of us, the 40% of us with the lower incomes are now um, spending 35 million on exempt items from the sales tax. We, or if we put the sales tax on it, their taxes would go up 35 million. That's how much we'd raise from them. However, in total, if you looked at, if you put the sales tax on, we bring in 126 million. So in other words, we're foregoing $126 million in revenue to save people 35 million. So hmm. theoretically, we could put that tax on everybody and give 35 million back to the 40% of us so that they're, they're not paying any more and then have like 85 million left over to lower the tax rate. One of the piece that I was really, um, the idea that we sort of expand the base in order to lower the rate, I think is really compelling for a few reasons. One, you know, we're down here in Brattleboro, Olga and I, and um, we're at the corner of Massachusetts and New Hampshire. So there's sort of fairly constant conversations about sales tax and I think probably more than in the middle of the state. Um, yeah, no tax New Hampshire. That's all we hear whenever taxes are mentioned yeah. in our community. But it's, it's, it's funny because the sort of flip side of that conversation is a lot of advocates, I think, especially for sort of millennials and their financial struggles or lower income people, this whole conversation about like, you could buy a house if you stopped buying lattes, right? Um, which isn't true. I think we all know that's not actually how savings works, right? But the, the sort of other side of that is the sales tax, the small percentage of sales tax is not what is standing between a, low, a lower income person and their ability to buy groceries. There's a lot more structural stuff that's you know, sort of standing in their way. Mm -hmm. Now, just uh, Emily and, and Deb, for the sake of our, our listeners, I wanted to check the recommendation with the sales tax was that we would expand um, the number of things it was applied to. But did the rate go back lower from like 6% to 3% or something? Right. And, and on the flip side, could people get more back in at the end of the year in taxes? Did that go up somehow? So like what you said, things are balancing out so that yeah. lower income people would, would still receive money even if that tax was going up. Right, so the okay. way, um, the, basically um, the way that this was modeled isn't necessarily what the legislature will do, but it's essentially saying we could expand the base, make sure that um, people making less than median or whatever don't pay any more, 
so that we essentially give them credits, um, reduce withholding tax, you know, so that they get it in their paycheck, not rather than at the end of the year. And we still take this extra money and we use it to lower the rate on everybody rather than collect any more. And so about the competition with New Hampshire, um, it'll still be there, except for Representative Beck said something interesting. I thought Mm -hmm. that, um, that New Hampshire needs revenue too. And that maybe by reducing the New Hampshire advantage, by reducing that differential, they might just say, what the heck? <laughs> I thought that was an interesting twist. <laughs> I rem- you know, when we were having a conversation about raising the minimum wage, um, there was a conversation about maybe if we did it, then New Hampshire would do it too. Um, so it's sort of a similar, because they'd still yeah. be able to have, you know, lower wages than us. Um, but they'd feel sort of more comfortable and compelled to raise it. So it's another, um, we don't need to, one of the other themes that we have in the show is we don't, we're probably not going to win a race to the bottom here in Vermont. Yeah. Um, and so even if we try, <laughs> we're just like too far, we're too far in the middle to win a race to the bottom. So why don't we try at least to move towards a race to the top and maybe we'll bring some other people along with us when we do that. Mm-hmm. I, I totally agree. The, um, the, one of the comments that we got was that we shouldn't be way out there, that we should move to the middle. And my sense is we want to move the middle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we can. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think that that does happen, that, um, you know, there are a bunch of studies where um, one county increases their sales taxed by a penny and then the next county feels oh good I can do it too and they do it um right so yeah I agree we don't want to we don't want to try to win the race at the bottom Mm -hmm. we have just about five minutes before we need to go to break uh Deb are there any um as we go into the second half are there any concepts or um other big picture issues you think listeners would benefit knowing before we before we move on i mean um i don't know i'd love to talk about possible changes to the education tax the homestead tax in particular yes but we should wait till the second half i think so i think that's slightly a deeper conversation one thing i would preview about it that's sort of a um a bonus to the conversation we're having right now is that Often when we leave Vermont to go to sort of conferences or talk with colleagues and we ask for advice about a range of things, um, you know, people will say, well, actually it's Vermont that's doing it well. And that's not true for everything. We have like the highest unemployment rate for women in the entire country. Like we are not, we are not magically wonderful, but um, we are often held up as having one of the most, as having the most progressive education taxation systems or education funding systems in the country. Um, And yet we can still do better. Um, Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that we need to stop because it's very, very complicated right now. And so um, that's one of the pieces of this, like that we are always continually tinkering to try to make things really work for everyone if we can. You know, I found the same thing going to other states, but I've also found that people will say, um, well, Vermont can do that because Vermont's a toy state. Toy? Uh, What? (laughs) Toy? Toy. Oh, I love that. (laughs) What does that mean? (laughs) And so, you know, at first I was sort of insulted, you know, like um, it's it's sort of, um, I'm a really small person and and I'm always patted on the head, (laughs) you know, and it sort of felt like, to a state, they're doing the same thing. Um, but then I thought, like, what they really mean is that we can try things. You know, mm-hmm. we're not big and cumbersome and complicated and clunky, and we just can try things out. And um, and people want to know about them. So we're nimble. Exactly. Nimble, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're, we're like well-trained dancers. We can move quickly and with ease. We are gymnasts. Gymnasts are really tiny, right? Yep. 
I like that. We're the gymnast state. I'm a little lost in the idea that anyone would ever dare to pat you on the head. So I'm going to try to (laughs) my thoughts on that by like saying it out loud. (laughs) Totally unacceptable behavior. If anyone is listening, don't pat other people on the head. (laughs) Yeah, that is actually kind of odd. (laughs) <laughs> we don't advocate that on the Montpelier Happy Hour, folks. But while we're That's on it. the topic, I will put in a plug for the views and opinions expressed on this show are those of the hosts and the guests and not of the radio station. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And on that note, we are going to take a break so we can hear from some of our underwriters. But the Montpelier Happy Hour on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro shall return in a moment. (laughs) Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. If you are just joining us, I'm your host, Olga Peters, and I have with me regular contributor, Representative Emily Kornheiser, as well as Deb Brighton, who is one of the members of Vermont's Tax Commission. And we are talking about the draft report that they submitted to the legislature in January. And it is a deep dive into not just a single specific tax, but also just the whole structure and some of the principles that uh, either are or not or are not being reflected in that tax structure about Vermont. Deb, thank you so much for joining us. If anyone thank wants you. to read the report, um, you can find that on um, either the House at Ways and Means Committee's website, the Senate Finance Committee's website, or I believe the Joint Fiscal Office's yep. website has a special spot for the Tax Structure Commission. Is that right? So they yes. have their own yeah. website, the Joint Tax Structure Commission. So you have at least three choices where you can find the exact same document. You have four, because I will put a link to it in our show notes on our website, which is the themontpelierhappyhour.captivate.fm. So if you want to read it, it is there. And this is a draft copy. And you could even read the draft copy and the final copy and compare them and see what <laughs> changed if you really want to have a good time on a Saturday night. <laughs> if you have a lot of time. <laughs> a lot of time on a Saturday night. <laughs> um, I'm hoping in this second half, we can talk a little bit about the education tax. But the other thing I was hoping we could touch on, Deb, and start wherever you feel comfortable. But there's, um, sometimes I come across data that shows how people of different income levels pay different proportions of that income to, towards certain taxes. And how, uh, this blows my mind, but how people in lower income brackets often will will pay a higher proportion of their income compared to someone in a higher income bracket. Could you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes, <laughs> that's the reason that we actually have, are looking at the structure as opposed to the individual taxes. The only progressive tax that we have, the only tax that, um, is designed to take a higher proportion of the income from people with higher income is the income tax. And the other state taxes are are basically regressive, meaning that they take a higher proportion of the income of people with less income. Um, And so when you put them all together, it's really, you're hoping that the income tax will overcome the regressivity of the others. If you think about, so if we go back to our property tax, if you're paying a property tax based on the value of your house um, and you're low, in, you're, let's say you're not low, you're $50,000 income and you have a $200,000 house. And so you're paying property tax on that. And then somebody who has a like $200,000 income could probably have a house that's three hundred thousand dollars, but that that tax is still a much smaller proportion of their income because their income is so much higher. House is slightly higher value, but their income is much higher. Um, <clears throat> so that's an example of a regressive tax. 
So the states, some states have a straight property tax like that and then have a progressive income tax, but it isn't enough to offset that. So their structure is, overall structure is regressive. Um, the, there is a national organization that is ITAP, um, Institute for Tax and Economic Policy, I think. And they try to measure that um, for every state. And so they divide the taxpayer population into quintiles, five groups with 20% of the people in each, starting with the lowest income 20%, going up to the highest income 20%. And they try to calculate, first of all, they start with the gross income and then they layer on top of that taxes that are paid. So that brings the income down. And then they add the extra step of um, looking at the transfers to the low income. That, so theoretically the taxes at the high income um, people pay go into some governmental services. Also some are direct benefits to people. Some are tax credits like the earned income tax credit. And so those tend to offset the regressivity. Um, but most states are still regressive. Mm -hmm. Vermont is very slightly progressive according to their measurement. <clears throat> and they have a, um, an, what they call an inequality index. And they say, if you start with just income um, and look at that distribution, and then you layer on the, um, the Vermont taxes, if it moves that distribution so that it's less extreme, um, then it's, it, it, it's a positive on the inequality index. For most states, it's a negative. I think there are only about three or four states where it's a positive. But part of the problem with that is um, if in income inequality keeps getting more and more extreme, it takes more and more effort to get us to the same place, even though it may look like our inequality index is better and better because it's working harder and harder, but we may be worse off. If that levels. makes any sense. There's but more the work more, to be done than we can do with the same sort of level of effort. Yeah. That's really interesting. And you've done a lot of work on um, sort of those extra layers that you talked about. So there's income and then on top of that income, for a lot of folks in Vermont, there's a whole lot of other transfers, um, like childcare financial assistance, for instance. Or, yeah. And so you've done a lot of really interesting work putting that all into account in someone's income and how that affects the overall progressivity. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Y yes. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, Let's see. I can guess I, what we what we can I start to you do. off with the part that's really fascinated me the most. Okay. Okay. So when I first heard of you, it was before I was in the legislature, uh, and I was working with the child development division, looking at childcare access, and people started using this phrase. My camera really is very like I'm on such a lag, <laughs> really awkward feeling. Um, you, I started hearing this phrase going around, the benefits trough, um, which I thought was so interesting because we talk so much about the benefits cliff. And when I was working more in welfare provision and not in childcare benefits provision, it was really, you know, people are getting benefits that there's no way anyone could ever live on in a million years. And then they get a job and the benefits sort of crash out but it was so terrible while they were getting the benefits anyway that it's sort of like the crash was okay because you could catch up again fairly quickly. Um, but the childcare benefits trough um, happens at a slightly higher income level and it goes on for so long. And that was so fascinating to me because when you described it, and actually when you described it in committee the other day, I was so struck by my own like really hearing my own lived experience described <laughs> as a statistic that like yeah. there's like $30,000 worth of income where your life will not feel even the slightest bit different. Mm -hmm. And that's just like, and that's how it felt at the time. But to have you describe it and like chart it was just really interesting to me. 
Yeah, it was something um, that surprised us when we did it. Um, actually, the I know you had Doug Hoffer on here at some point. And yes, our listeners love him. He has a great radio voice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So that was the first week that study he talked about in 99, I think about the livable income yep. um, was my assignment was to look at the, um, the benefits and how they fit into the livable income. And when you got off of them, that sort of stuff. Um, and I was surprised by what we found, but um, so this is sort of related to the earlier discussion about layering on the taxes um, when you take the, the revenue that you've gotten from the state and it, put it into benefits, and then you look at, um, you know, are people better off? If you lump all the people together, you sort of see, you know, that um, that they are. <laughs> you know, you see a combination of your increase in your earnings, um, and. Um, it's enough to overcome if you have to pay more taxes or you don't get as much in tax credits. It doesn't really matter because, as you said, your income is going up and up that um, you feel like you're going up. But um, the people for if when you divide them and people up and, and don't lump them all together, but you look at sort of individual households, as we had for the basic needs budget, you know, we had six possible households we tried to figure out what what their basic needs were so one of those households well a bunch of them had children and the children are all four years old and six years old and they don't ever get any older <laughs> <laughs> what a nightmare <laughs> <laughs> so you know they they need child care um and one is part-time and one is pretty much full-time. And they, you know, you look at a household with either one working adult or two working adults, it, it doesn't much matter. They need childcare. And um, the cost of childcare is really significant. So when you layer on all of those things, um, it, child care is the one that really makes the difference. But the interesting thing is that all of these different programs were designed individually and they were designed with the best intentions of putting their money right where the people need it the most, which is somewhere around 100% of federal poverty level and under. And so that's what they all did individually. And then because they didn't wanna have a cliff they didn't want to say, oh, you're 101% of federal poverty level, you get nothing. They all created an off ramp, you know? And so if people only get one or two of those, that's that, you know, and they've got the increase in their income, they, they do okay. Um, but when you put them all together, particularly with needing childcare assistance, um, you're not okay. And so I think if you're a single parent household. I remember that. What's before. that? Particularly, I think for single parent households, it's the most extreme it is. example I remember. See, and, and we've recently made a change to child care. So it's a single family household with two kids that's that's more extreme in. But it's it's the same for two working parents and two kids. Uh, not quite as extreme. Um, but if you think of it, well, so when these, first of all, the different benefits were and their off ramps were all determined independently, you know, not as a unit. Um, but the off ramps and, you know, where they reached their maximum weren't really coordinated. It was just people were saying, we were going, we're aiming it, everybody said, we're aiming this at the greatest need and then we're going to decline. Um, and so in that process, everything starts fading out after 100% of federal poverty level. And so the, um, so I was looking at the, the example that we had was a single mom with two kids. And um, so the federal poverty level is around $21,000. And the minimum wage in that year would have brought you 22,000. So somewhere in that, Somewhere in that range, um, 
you know, is 100% of federal poverty level and you're, you're getting kind of the maximum of things. So then if you look at that same family unit between, and say they move between 30,000 and 32,500 in income. So that's around 150% of federal poverty level. It's on the downslope for about everything. So let's say they got a dollar raise in there for every dollar of raise that they got, they'd lose 16 to 24 cents in food stamps and SNAP benefits, 28 cents in the EIT earned income tax credit, 30 cents in childcare subsidy, eight cents in payroll tax that they'd have to pay. And then there are all these other things like fuel assistance and you have to pay um, more income taxes and you lose more rent or rebate. So you're actually going backwards and you keep going backwards. You don't even get to the same point until you're about at $60,000 in income. And that's that long, long time where you, and if you think about how much more responsibility and how hard you have to work to increase your income that much, and then have nothing more in your pocket. It's, it's devastating. Wild. And so I want to like really highlight a few points from here. One is that unless we're able to look across like the entire structure of different family units, different financial quintiles, different arrangements of people in those quintiles, and the combination of both income and taxation and benefits, unless we're able to do that like structurally and we have spaces like the Tax Structure Commission and studies to do that, we won't see that happening. And right. we have such like one of my key values as a legislator and something we talk about a lot on the show is how important and powerful it is to be able to see yourself in the data, right? to be able to see that your life story, your life history, your community experience is something that's like available to government to make decisions with, right? And so this is such an amazing example to me of both the power of being able to look across a problem and an opportunity for us to really see ourselves in things and something that taxes can go a long way, tax structure can go a long way to fixing but also we'll need to be bringing in other conversations um, in other sort of state agencies and other legislative committees. So I just want to sort of really frame the incredible um, opportunity that there is when we have conversations like this. Thank you, Emily. Yeah. I want to shift um, to the education tax because I believe one of the recommendations of the um, report is to restructure the homestead education tax from a property to an income tax? Well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the, I, they call, it's called a property tax now, um, but it's a combination of a property tax and an income tax. Um, and so it's, it almost is the worst of both. <laughs> But really, um, the, the biggest problem that we found when we listened to all sorts of people give us so many comments about the education tax, it was hard to even organize them. But when we finally did, we realized that the biggest problem was complexity of our current system, that nobody really understood um, what they were going to have to pay if they voted in the school budget. Um, they didn't understand why. Um, it went up or down. They didn't really understand that they were act most for most people, they were actually paying on income, but they paid on property in the first year and they got an adjustment in the second year for what they should have should have paid on the first year. So it was really confusing. Then also you had the two systems. Um, property tax is traditionally administered locally by local listers and then income, income taxes by the state tax department. They have different people working on it, different rules, different confidentiality requirements. So we're sort of running, not only were we running two systems, but we had to try to make them work together with their different calendars and their different rules. So 
um, it was really complex. <clears throat> and so we decided, first we were looking for simplicity. We decided we wanted to have it be a direct tax, not have it, you know, half in one year and half in the next year. And we wanted it to be one tax, not two taxes, property and income. And then we decided because of what we talked about before about is the value of your house a good indication of your ability to pay? We decided that the tax we would use would be income tax because that was better. Um, so we've sort of thrown out that um, adjustment um, to your process. And basically um, for ho homeowners, for residents, um, your school tax would just be a percentage of your income and that rate, the percentage, the rate is voted in by your school district. So at school meeting, the school board would say, this is our total budget. We divide it by pupils. Our per pupil spending is gonna be $18,000. We compare that to the state yield and it, it comes up with a rate and that's 2.5% of your income. So everybody's gonna pay 2.5% of your income. And the income, if we were doing that this year, if we were going to school meeting this March, we'd be basing this on the income of 2020 that we're in the process of tabulating to file our income tax. So you would know at that point what you have to pay during the year. Wow. <laughs> so I say wow, because it is so much simpler yeah. than, than um it feels like it is now. I don't know if that's your response, Emily. I, in some ways, yes. I think in some ways the way it is now is often explained in a more complicated way than needs to be <laughs> explained. And so it further perpetuates people's sense that it's a profoundly confusing system. Um, There's that. But because like what Deb just described is sort of what we do for half, you know, for some people, um, but it's yeah. hard to ever explain that way. That's how we do it unless you make more than $100,000 a year. And then we do it this other way. And there's a very clear way to figure out your, you know, the percentage of your home value. And that is named for you. So I think part of it is that we're constantly describing it as complicated and that makes it complicated. But I do, yeah. I do think this is more straightforward. I think the two questions that keep on coming up, um, especially in Wyndham County is, you know, what about all of those folks with very low, incomes um, and very high value homes. You know, the phrase that I see people use sort of casually is like all the people with the trust funds living in, you know, the living in the hills. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, now they're, they're paying on income and they would continue to pay on income. So it wouldn't be a change from now yeah. from the current situation for those people. Thanks for saying that. And <laughs> <laughs> so for, for you, Emily, I'm not um, sure how I'm many sorry, there are. No, I just wondered how many there are. I don't, I mean, I have no idea. I don't think anyone knows how many there are. And I yeah. think, um, you know, the way um, object lessons can become red herrings and, you know, um, confirmation bias and the stories we tell about our communities. I think perhaps that example is more outsized in our imagination than in reality is all I'm, not that it's not real, it's just, yeah. um, and I'm sure it's more real in Vermont than it might be in some other states. Um, because I think we have mm -hmm. a long history of people moving here explicitly to sort of drop out of the world of commerce. Um, and you need to really be able to afford to drop out of the world of commerce in order to do that effectively. but. Um, I do think it's not quite as um, widespread as it is poignant. And mm -hmm. I appreciate your explanation that in fact, those people are already paying on income because they are below the income threshold because we're not actually in neither case with income or with property tax, are we taxing wealth? Right, that's what I was gonna say. <laughs> I mean, we need to figure out to get, we need to get a better idea of how to get an ability to pay. Right. Um, 
If we only I have, have the answer to it. just about five minutes, Deb, and I, I know you don't, you said you don't have the answer, but I am curious <laughs> if we really wanted to dig into that, like, where would we start? Like, how would we even start on that path of understanding how to tax wealth, for lack of a better term? Well, um, Europe, some of the OECD countries have done um, asset taxes and, and it's amazing like how many issues they have, you know, and how, and, and how they've worked on definition and, um, <clears throat> you know, and the problems that they've run into people um, very publicly moving to another country, <laughs> for example, because of the tax. Um, and I think we can learn a lot from them. I think we need to figure out what reporting we can do to get a handle on what this is. Um, and I, you think about, we've come a long way in trying to um, understand people's income. You know, I, if you can imagine um, bef- trying to get people to be honest about their <laughs> income. Um, back in the days when we just, started an income tax, Um, but you know, it's working pretty well. I'm sure that that there are lots of ways to get around it, but there are lots of ways that we can measure income. And we just, uh, I think we need to start trying to figure out how we can get some reporting done on some of the other types of assets that we don't have data on before we can even start to figure out what's fair. the, from my, you know, very limited knowledge, the one time that really someone's wealth is tallied explicitly is when they die. Yeah. And that wealth is passed on. Um, and we, you know, are about to see a real big generational shift mm-hmm. in this country um, and a generation that's accumulated quite a bit of wealth. And so it's an interesting time to be thinking about our estate taxes, because one of sort of the new principles that I've been working with, um, and I have a post-it note, is about this idea. Um, I, I like to do post-it note themes for my, you know, a few weeks at a time. Um, <laughs> keep my life interesting. Thanks for um, <laughs> is, is this idea that we need to sort of tax for the economy of next, we need tax policy that works for the economy of next year and the year after, not for last year, right? Yeah. Um, we need to be always sort of trying to imagine that future, which I, is often much easier in Vermont than it is in other states, since the future sort of seems to happen other places and then come <laughs> first. Right? We can see it coming. Yeah, can see it coming. Like if, you, if you're like working in New York or California, you can't see the future coming. It comes to you first. But here we can actually see the future coming, right? <laughs> you like got to read articles about the gig economy before it showed up here. And yet, so we're not prepared. So I... <laughs> Um, I think that's a real opportunity for us sort of looking into the future of how to measure, um, to measure wealth in a realer way, especially really extreme wealth. Thank you. We are out of time and I know Emily needs to get to another meeting. So I just want to quickly close the show with a toast. Um, I just want to toast to you, Deb, and your fellow commissioners for the deep dive you took into the structure of the Vermont tax system. And thank you for applying questions like people's ability to pay and really looking at the impacts of taxes and not just the numbers of taxes. So here's to Deb. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. (laughs) (laughs) The Montpelier Happy Hour can be found Friday at 2 p.m. on WVEW, 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. You can also find it at the Montpelier Happy Hour dot Captivate dot FM. And Emily, where can people Folks find you? You can find me at emilykornheiser.org, where there are links for my email, my phone number, my address, my Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or you're <laughs> welcome to join me every Saturday at 10 a.m. for a community conversation via Zoom. Thank you everybody and have a wonderful weekend. Take care.